um, thank you so much for making time and for um, allowing us to spend the Monday evening together. Uh, let me just share my screen. Welcome to Decolonization, Racism and Inequality in the Climate Justice Movement, our Back to Basics workshop, where we are all going to collectively unpack what these terms mean to us and what a justice society sort of looks like for us. Uh, and maybe before we actually start with that, I'll give a small little introduction and then uh, we'll take it from there. So my name is Michelle, for those who don't know me. I am a programs manager at the African Climate Alliance with a specific focus on the education portfolio. And with me today is my colleague, Gabriel, who I'm going to tag in here just to uh, maybe say hello before we get into the house rules um, and other such things. Gabriel, over to you. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Gabriel Klaassen, uh, Youth Coordinator and Programs Manager at African Climate Alliance. It's a pleasure being here. Um, I'm looking forward to today's session. As I saw Michelle create the presentation and my mind is booming, uh, I will be a co-facilitator and technical support for anyone who needs it, as well as to assist people to make sure that you get the links that you need. Um, post the workshop as well. Uh, yeah, just a bit of logistics. Um, and before we kind of jump into it, Michelle, if I could just talk about the logistics about data reimbursements. I know that that's something that people want to know about. Um, a little bit of information about data reimbursement uh, is there's a link that we will share via email, but I'm also popping it in the chat now, um, which is basically uh, a, um, a, I can't really turn my volume up, unfortunately, um, but maybe you can turn yours up. Um, but basically, um, uh, you fill out that form after this workshop. You've been present. I've marked you present on the <laughs> on the register, so to speak. Uh, and so, when you fill out that form, use the same name that you registered with um, to attend this workshop, so we can ensure that you make sure that you get your data reimbursement uh, should you need it. Um, the data does take about. Uh, there's a process and a problem with the app that we use sometimes, and so. The technicalities of it all is a bit complicated, but we try to make sure that everyone is reimbursed within a period of seven days of attending the workshop. And so uh, and so it'll be awesome. Um, so right now I'm going to tag Michelle back in and then we'll go from there. Uh, thanks, Gabriel. I'm also just checking to see if my audio is fine. Uh, maybe just a thumbs up from people, if you can hear me all good. No? Ah, thanks, Natasha. Um, Perfect. So, yeah, um, welcome to the space. Uh, our Back to Basics workshops are aimed at, you know, dismantling some of these uh, concepts, taking them apart and really understanding what they mean. So we are wanting to understand what decolonization means. Uh, we know that it probably comes from the word colonization. But why is it relevant in the climate justice movement? We also want to look at inequality and how that ties into equity. We want to look at racism and how that ties into colon colonization and other such things. So before we do get started, um, maybe it might be a good idea to sort of check in. You can do this in the chat, um, but just pop in your name. I see some people already doing it, which is wonderful. So thank you for that. Uh, pop in your name, where you're from. Uh, a feeling word and then one thing that brought you joy this month for me my name is Michelle as I've said and I'm joining from Cape Town South Africa and I feel joyful um, and what brought me joy this month was getting some much needed sun last week those who are in Cape Town know that our weather is what our weather is so sometimes when you get that little bit of sun it's always very exciting so just lay there and that's what I did um I do see some people are joining, some from South Africa, others from Uganda. Anna is joining from Zambia. So please do keep doing that, um, just so we're all a little bit familiar with each other. Elwin is joining from Uganda. Samson from Malawi. Natasha uh, from Zambia. Frida from Zambia as well. Thomas from Zambia. Calvin, I'm assuming from Malawi. Do correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Thailand is joining from Durban. Sh 
Sharif is joining from Uganda. And so is Brian. Sharon from Kenya, James from Malawi. Mohini is joining from South Africa, feeling content and has been enjoying the rain, quite the opposite of me. Raphael from Zambia. Awesome, thank you guys for sharing where you're joining from. Uh, Andrew from Zambia as well, Tina from Zambia. Awesome. Tobias from Zambia as well. And the Siwe, also Siwe, is joining from South Africa. Um, and what made her happy today or this week is being part of the March on the 24th of September. That's quite exciting, isn't it? Calvin. Calvin is from Zambia. Gideon from Zambia in Lusaka and feeling very excited. Amuja from Uganda, feeling great. Titus from Uganda. Good, good to see you. Marie from Cape Town is feeling quite excited, especially because they were able to reunite with one of their very close friends. Really excited to meet you all. We're very excited to have you. Um, awesome stuff. And maybe just before we move in um, or more, just to establish some ground rules, because what often happens in these spaces is we all just have to be on the same um, sort of page. And that's what we are going to do, right? So these are some of the rules of engagement. And this is just so we are all um, maybe giving each other a chance and just making sure that we all get a chance to engage as best as possible. So if you do have a contribution or a question, please do raise your hand or put a star in the chat, your hand or a star in the chat. Uh, we please invite you to practice the rule of two where you allow two people to speak or contribute before you continue or you contribute again. Um, so maybe myself, Gabriel, and Mohini can try this out. Um, I'm going to say hello and take Gabriel in. Hello, 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 hello. Who takes Mohini in? Hello, hi, everyone. I'm Mohini. And then I speak again because two people have spoken before me. So that is the rule of two. Uh, thanks, Mohini, for coming in there. Um, and then please feel free to use your home language. The hope that we can have someone who can translate in the room. Um, I do see that a lot of us are joining, it seems according to region. So we might be lucky and find someone who can translate in the room. Raphael, I do see your hand. I'll take hands. Um, we'll create some space where we can all sort of discuss and take hands at the end. Um, so I do note your hand there. Um, if we can't find somebody who can translate uh, our our best tool to go to will be Google Translate and really hope that the message is sort of consistent with what you would have wanted to share with us. Um, and if you're not comfortable with unmuting, you're more than welcome to use the chat. Um, we will read that. We, that's why we are here. <laughs> um, and maybe just to apologize for using English as a primary language, because we do understand that it doesn't always accommodate everybody. However, it is our primary language of communication in this space. Um, so please do um, forgive us for that, but also please be patient with us in the same breath. Um, yeah, and I think with that, we can get right into it. Um, just by looking a little bit at the context with which we are coming into the space, just this whole space, right? So. We have noted, right, I mean, history, current history, uh, past history, all of that has sort of shown us that systems and practices such as colonialism, racism, discrimination, sexism, and other forms of oppression gave tools to some people to advance in the form of wealth, maybe education, access to resources, while at the same time, so many others were and are actively being excluded from the same world 
So what the systems I've just mentioned, colonialism, racism, discriminations, discrimination, and other such oppressive systems, what they did or what they continue to do is create a world or several worlds that are only um, exclusive for a particular group of people. If you go back in time, uh, a couple of years ago, still in, South, in Africa, so if you go back maybe 30 years ago, 50 years ago, and in some instances, 20 years ago, because some countries have only recently gained independence from colonialism uh, or colonialist structures. If you go back in time several years, you will find that um, in a South African context, there were particular spaces that were only kept for white folk. And that is a very, uh, or some spaces that were, that black and brown bodies were not allowed to access. And that is a very good example of these worlds that I am talking about that were created to exclude um, a group of people or maybe only service another group of people. So as you may imagine, this resulted in people and our environment suffering the consequences of greed, exploitation, and capitalism. Um, currently, we are we happen to be in the space that we're in, um, fighting for climate justice because of such systems that treated people um, as disposable, you know, that treated the environment as disposable, which is why you find that we are continuing as the world, we are continuing to extract from the earth, drilling and getting oil and other fossil fuels, which is only further destructing our environment. Um, so once we've got a little bit of insight into the past, which I think we're going to be discussing a little bit more as we move, once we've got a little bit of that context, um, we then realize that we are needing to create a just and equitable future, right? We are needing to make sure that people and the world get justice, that people get access to resources, right? That people uh, are no longer excluded from spaces, that oppressive structures like capitalism and colonialism cease to exist, that exploitation is a way of the past it then is important that we as a society get to that point where we all have access in a just and equitable way. And we're going to be exploring a little bit more like concepts around justice, concept ar concepts around uh, equity and what that, mean, what that means. Um, but before we do that, right, before we say this is a framework that works for reaching a point where the world is now uh, a just and equitable world where social justice has been, um, you know, achieved, we need to first understand the past so we can better carve out the future that serves all of us, right? So this is a world that does not include, um, that does not exclude any one person or any group of people, but one that really just aims to make sure that we all exist in the world with the same sort of access to things and are not feeling othered just because of other systems that don't fit us. So it calls for us to first understand concepts like decolonization or decentralization or justice, because then that helps us to reimagine or at least start to reimagine a world where the past no longer has any power over us. So then, what does it actually mean to decolonize and decentralize the climate justice movement? And before we get into that, I want to invite us um, to maybe just think a little bit about that. Um, what does decolonize or decentralize mean? So give us a minute to just think about that. And while we do that, maybe also think about why and how that is relevant to our context, which is maybe climate justice, climate activism, and even social activism. And as we think about that, um, can I invite, I'm just gonna share the next slide now. Can I then invite us to share our thoughts around maybe what decolonization means for us or to us as individuals? Maybe what it means for the region that I come from, right? Um, or 
maybe what it means for my continent what does it mean for Africa I'll give an example of the city of Cape Town right um, I am from the Western Cape and because of what history has done for us and to us right we see that um, even now um, there are areas which don't necessarily have the same access to resources as others you will find that people will use uh, terms like an affluent area meaning an area where people who have money sort of live um, and a lot of the times that also has a historical sort of attachment to it in that those same people who live in affluent areas quote unquote would have had access um, while oppressive structures were being forced upon a particular group of people who might now find themselves in what are called disadvantaged areas or as we like to refer to them at ACA as um, purposefully ignored. So Calvin, Calvin um, shared their thoughts in the chat to say the action or process of a state withdrawing from a former colony or leaving it independent. That's what Calvin understands decolonization as. Samson says, free from colonial rule. Could I also ask us to maybe just expand on that a little bit? And as we think about that, um, additional questions to sort of think about too. Do you feel like we're making progress on the road to justice in Africa? And maybe what does, what does justice even mean? What does that look like for us? And what still needs to happen if there's anything that needs to happen? I mean, you could be in the audience thinking nothing needs to happen. We've already reached uh, the point where we need to reach in terms of justice. Um, and that's completely valid, right? This is a safe space for sharing and for collaborating. So please do feel free to share and um, yeah, just share your thoughts. And then lastly, what are your thoughts on reparations in general? Uh, but more specifically, climate reparations. And I'll give a little bit con a little bit of context on the last question there. Um, so year in, year out, countries or heads of states around the world meet at what's called COP, that's Conference of the Parties. And it is um, a conference that is or that was created by the UNCCC, which is the United Nations Convention on Climate Change. Uh, and what the space is meant for is for uh, countries all over the world to come together and really just decide on what to do about climate change. And so at one, um, and I might be able to tag Gabriel here, um, because I speak under correction, but at one of these uh, COPs, I don't remember if it was COP26, uh, countries came together and there were talks around climate reparations. So what this looked like was um, richer countries coming together and saying, we will give um, you know, some money to other countries to help fight climate change. Mm -hmm. Um, Gabriel. So to add to that, Michelle, I think you're on the money, um, but left side to the money, not directly on it, um, which is that um, last year at COP26, um, the UK, the US, um, the uh, EU, Germany, um, and I think it was uh, one more country um, basically pledged a certain amount of money to South Africa in a partnership um with the hope that there could be a um with the hope that there could be a, a form of just transition which is a transition from a uh, very monopolized fossil fuel industry to one that has more renewable energy in south africa and so that's a form of climate reparations acknowledging your historical past when it comes to um the impact that you've made on the land and its people and uh reparations can be in the form of money it can be a form of act or service as well. Um, but oftentimes when people talk about reparations or climate reparations specifically, um, they talk about money, uh, fiscal support, um, when it comes to uh, making sure that, hey, 
the least you can do is help us move from A to B because you've taken everything here and so now we can't grow. That's kind of the biggest excuse for people saying we should keep with fossil fuels because uh, it's our time to grow our economies, our countries, when in fact we could be, you know, leading countries um, across Africa um, investing in the renewable energies and alternatives so that we can build our future, um, not only in more sustainable practices, but, you know, with support. Um, or rather not support, but owed, <laughs> owed support um, coming forward. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that, Gabriel. Um, yeah, so now that we know a little bit more around uh, reparations or climate reparations, uh, maybe more to think about. Um, and while we do that, I'm just going to be reading some contributions in the chat. Um, but also before I do do that, could I ask that we please respect our differing opinions, right? So uh, we are very different people who've come into the space. So if we can please um, just respect each other's opinions, each other's sharings. This is a space that is supposed to be safe for all. Um, so please do make sure that... Um, how you would like people to engage with you in a safe and respectful manner is the way that you're going to be engaging with others. Um, and with that, I will just read some of the contributions in the chat. Panasha says decolonization is getting rid of and learning and unlearning habits and ideologies that colonialism engraved into our brains. Luke says decolonization to not only take away the colonizer itself, but take away the ways of thinking and methodology of engagement that made a colonial system possible in the first place. Sharon says getting back to, into our independence, free from the colonialism that might have imposed harsh rules and ideas that hindered our growth as a continent. Yes, we're making progress as a continent. Mohini says decolonization will allow for the abolishing of the oppressive system that, that it is in the environmental crisis and ra that racism, sorry, I'll just read that one more time. Mohini says decolonization will allow for the abolishing of the oppressive, sis of the oppressive system that the environmental crisis and racism is derived from, derived from. Frida says decolonization means redefining climate change in the African context. Gideon says decolonization is simply a shift from being under someone's obligations and rules and regulations to becoming a self-reliance body where rules and regulations are created natively. Nozibu Siso says justice in the, South, in the context of South Africa, I think. There's a lot that still needs to be done. I believe justice in South Africa would be economic justice, land access um, to quality education, health, ETC. I think justice is access. And Noah says, to free a people and area from colonial status, to relinquish control of a subjugated people area, the year the country was decolonized, the country faces international pressure to decolonize the territory. Um, right, so I think just from the chat and the contributions that we've been given, giving, I think that um, I think that we have sort of like a good basis of what decolonization is or what it means, right? Um, so it is the opposite of colonialism. Uh, colonization was when um, what at the world at the time were called superpowers came through and did what is also named Partition for Africa. Uh, where Africa was taken and divided according to different Western countries. Um, so you had, it was Rhodesia at the time, um, you had Mozambique that was under Portuguese rule, you had um, other different petitions. I think also if you look at it in the context of language that's spoken in the different regions, if you're looking at Africa as the context um, is that the different languages that are spoken in those regions will tell you uh, of the colonial rule. So for instance, uh, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, predominantly French speaking, were under French colonial rule. So the process of decolonization um, involves 
really just taking apart the ideas that colonialism brought. So the, the, the ideas such as uh, black and brown folk were inferior to white folk, um, ideas such as black and brown folk were only good for specific things in the context of South Africa, uh, the sort of education that was offered to black and brown people only enabled them um, in most cases to work as housekeepers or garden boys or things like that because there were spaces that they were not allowed to be in or occupy. So the act of decolonizing means that also recognizing that race in itself is a myth, right? So you, you then start to relook um, where your identity is tied in, what are the things that you um, believe about yourself. I think it was several years ago where there was a, an actual problem with black and brown folk using skin lightening creams because of this idea that proximity to whiteness or the more you look like a white person, the more desirable you were. And that's just an example. Um, Again, I invite if you need to raise your hand or share anything, um, this is a space for that. So please feel free. Uh, just in, uh, more contributions in the chat. Bamuje says, uh, justice to Africa is a long way to go like a country like Uganda, but decolonization is in doing, is undoing colon, colon, colonialism. Uh, decolonization means standing on independently as a state and making sure the citizens are able to grow and make choices based on what they feel is right and not imposed. That's Natasha. Agba. Brenda says decolonization is about cultural, psychological, and economic freedom for indigenous people with the goal of achieving indigenous sovereignty. Thank you very much for all of those um, contributions. I think it's all like feeding into the conversation, which is really, really exciting. Um, so I think just by thinking a little bit about um, whether we feel like Africa is making progress on the road to justice. I think we've heard some sentiments to say, yes, we do feel that way. Uh, and around what needs to happen, I think that's what would then be sort of uncovering as we move into the space, right? As we move or as we progress in this um, sort of workshop. Um, and to just make sure that we are all on the same page again, is we're going to start maybe before we get into like the discussion or the discussing bit of today's workshop uh, is that I'm just going to define some terminologies and maybe give a little bit more um, a little bit more ideas um, flesh it out a little bit more the um, the definitions that we have. So for us to be really able to be having one conversation, for instance, we need to have like a common understanding of what, what is, right? So I'm going to define a few terms and then we're going to build our discussion on that. Uh, so the first thing is climate justice and what that even means. Uh, just one minute, please. Cool. So maybe while Michelle's um, busy sorting something out, um, we can all start putting our own understandings and ideas of what climate justice is um, forward in our minds. Just so when we look at the, we don't have to put in the chat if you don't feel like it, because there's a lot of admin work for you guys, but it is a workshop. Um, but rather starting to understand for ourselves, what do we think climate justice is? Um, so when Michelle shows us the definition, we're able to kind of compare our idea versus what Michelle's bringing forward. And I don't want to see people saying it's when the climate is just, 
you know <laughs> maybe a bit more depth to to the answer than that um but yeah I, I see a message in the chat let me read it aloud um i'm so fascinated by everyone's responses of definition of de decolonization and then a bit, a bit of love to michelle uh for adding such practical um examples to it and adding um to the bag of knowledge i love that um cool Um, Michelle, are you back? No, oh, so, um, Raphael, go for it. Do you have an understanding or a thought that you'd like to add to it? What, what's your idea all about right, all right. Um, how much it is? Um, I don't really have a definite answer, but I would just like to contribute uh, based on my understanding, what I understand about uh, climate justice. Uh, first of all, we have a climate uh, which is a natural atmosphere on which uh, um, all the living organisms should be able uh, to survive from. But because of human behavior, because of human selfish behavior, and uh, especially uh, in, the, in our modes of uh, consumption and in our modes of uh, production, we have been emitting harmful gases that go into the atmosphere. These harmful gases, they can also be attributed to as uh, greenhouse gases. These greenhouse house gases, they, um, they cause a lot of uh, harmful, sub, uh, harmful uh, things to our environment, such as uh, causing a, a climate change and um, a global warming. So when you talk about uh, climate justice, uh, climate justice is a, is a way of um, restoring the environment to its original state in which it was there naturally before human, human beings started contaminating it by carbon emissions in the atmosphere. So I think that's what I can understand about uh, climate justice. I submit. Thank you so much, Rafael. I think you, you've you added such nuanced points and such depth to your answer. I think I, I love the kind of answer there and also the one in the chat by, uh, I'm not sure who is the one that said it. I think it was um, was Gideon and uh, I know that Agaba sent something and Thomas is also sending something. Yeah, I see Michelle's back and so not a problem. Um, but yeah, I think it's really cool to to kind of hear and see what your, your understanding of climate justice is and the shared collective knowledge, which I think is such an important part to understand is that these workshops are a space to build collective knowledge. So yeah, um, I'm actually not gonna take any more hands um, just because um, I think maybe we can look at what Michelle's viewpoint is of climate justice, the definition that she's written up for us and go from there. And I'll pass back to Michelle for the main facilitation and I'll be in the background to assist where I can. Thanks Gabriel for holding space. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm still kind of recovering from, from, from that uh, definition as well um, that Raphael gave us. Uh, and I do note the definitions that have been shared in the chat. So we'll just come back to them um, just after I, I see all of them coming through. Um, thank you guys for sharing. Um, and I'm just going to be sharing my screen, then we can just see um, uh, sort of like a, a a mini raised version of the definition. And then I think it would help to just get into the chat and then get a little bit more of what people are thinking. Um, so we use the term climate justice to refer to the social, moral and political implications of climate change and not just the physical and environmental impacts, right? So that means that when we're looking at uh, climate justice, we're looking at the whole face and not just the environmental aspects. Um, we're looking at the fact that people are being affected in so many ways um, other than just one. So their rights to education. I mean, if you look at an example, like in Pakistan right now, uh, there was nonstop rain for about three months and the country has just, um, you know, I think I speak under correction, gone into a state of emergency just because people's houses and livelihoods have all been like disrupted. And so when we're starting the conversation around climate justice, uh, we need to first acknowledge that different groups of people are affected in different ways by climate change. Um, an example is that developing countries, like countries in the global south, so Africa, um, um, countries in the Asia region, all of those are not responsible for most of the greenhouse gas emissions, but are suffering the consequences of the rapidly changing climate. And while developing countries, so countries in the global north, that's where Canada, your America, and all those countries, they're not experiencing the same kinds of disasters. I think it was just a couple of um, weeks ago when UK, for the first time in several years, experienced high, high temperatures of about 40 degrees, and that made the news, right? 
because oh my gosh climate change is finally real but while other countries in the global south continue to experience um, the effects and the harmful impacts of climate change and for some reason these things are only spoken about when the global north experiences it so this is sort of like what happens or the definition that we've come up with for uh, climate justice it really just looks at i guess what you could call the most affected communities um, and then really just uh, gets into things like developing solutions um, making sure that when you develop those solutions you're also taking into account the fact that the people of that region um, have a world of knowledge uh, other than what we've seen in recent years where like climate solutions have been developed elsewhere and then forced and then obviously have not worked so I think with that we just move into um, also just reading some of the um, contributions that have been given I had seen a hand uh, you'll forgive me I forgot who had put it up if you can do that again for us please um, so that we can take your hand uh, but while that person brings their hand up again I'd like to just read some of the thoughts in the chat around climate justice um, so climate justice from our own view this is Brenda is like framing global warming as an ethical and political issue rather than one that is purely environmental or physical in nature climate justice this is from Gideon is the advocacy or awareness about the impact of climate change hence bringing out to people's attention the dangers of certain human activities and the impacts to the environment. Thomas says climate justice is taking up the stand in fighting climate injustices such as the burning of plastics, which later contribute negative, which later contribute negatively to the ozone layer. So this also speaks to the greenhouse gas emissions that are emitted and obviously destroy um, or cause even larger holes in our ozone layer. Pamuja says climate justice can be finding solutions to the climate crisis. Mohini says uh, climate justice calls for justice in all spaces, acknowledging the inner workings of the corrupt system we live in and how it disproportionately affects the people who are less responsible for this crisis. Climate justice acknowledges the need to understand the problems faced by communities most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change such as the countries or the communities that I've just mentioned, like Pakistani, for instance, um, Pakistan, for instance, uh, with the floods that are currently ravishing the country. Gideon says climate justice is a call to raise awareness about climate change related issues. Tina says climate justice is a concept that addresses the justice just division, fair sharing, and equitable distribution of the benefits of burdens of climate change. While Calvin says climate justice is a concept that addresses the... Hmm. Uh, justice is a concept that addresses the just division, fair sharing, and equitable distribution of the benefits and burdens of climate change and responsibilities to deal with climate change. Right. Noah says climate justice promotes an urgent action needed to prevent climate change, which must be based on community led solutions all around the world. Thompson says climate justice is a way of dealing with climate related issues equally, regardless of race, nation, or anything else. Andrew says climate justice is used to measure climate justice to measures that can be taken to stop environmental damage and restore the environment. And we have a question from Noah. What's the difference between environmental justice and climate justice? And we'll come to the question uh, in a bit. Uh, just finishing. Um, reading so give says finding solutions to the climate crisis that not only reduce emissions or protect the natural world but 
do that in a way which creates a fairer, more just and more equal world in the process. Climate justice has to do with establishment of solutions and policies that address climate change. That's Sayoa. I'll read the last uh, contribution before we have to move on a little bit. Climate justice is the initiatives and actions taken to eradicate the poor management and degradation of the environment to ensure their solutions to address climate change. Gideon, I do see your hand, but I do also note uh, that I did read uh, a contribution um, in the chat. Uh, so you will forgive me for not giving you time right now, but allow me to give you time when we come back to the next session. Um, so the next term that we are wanting to define is justice. What actually is justice? We've now seen what climate justice is. We've spoken about it being a way to equitably divide resources to ensure that people all around the world are able to deal with the effects of climate change. What is that word justice and what does it actually mean? So justice is widely understood as giving each person what they deserve. Uh, what that means is that in the social justice space or in the space that deals with justice of people uh, or societies, it's understood that all members of society deserve access to resources, education, shelter, safe and livable conditions, all of that. Um, and also recognizing that all these fall under the basic human rights that all members of society are entitled to. For instance, we all deserve access to clean water. We all de deserve access to education. We all deserve access to food. Um, and so that's what justice is all about, ensuring that each person needs to have their basic human rights met for them to then properly exist and even function in our society, all right? So a just society can only be born when we start dismantling the unjust systems that continue to disadvantage the majority of people and subject them to harsh living conditions or place the same people in what are called food deserts, for example. So this is a term that is predominant or prominent in uh, America and even other parts of the world. So a food desert um, is an area that does not have access to nutritious foods. So you would only have like a lot of fast foods. You would not have as much access to things like fresh produce and other such things. So a just society aims to solve all of those problems. And then we look at and because we're looking at decolonization, we're looking at decentralization, we're looking at inequality and racism, we first understand that colonization is actually a product of racism. And while racism is just a concept and a myth that aims to uh, create systems that progress a certain kind of people, which has historically been white people, it is also um, the the birther, if you will, of colonization. So the whole idea behind colonization was that black and brown folk were um, less than, right, or inferior rather to white people, which is something that is obviously not true and something that we then have to sort of explore when we start talking about the act of decolonization and explore our concepts around race and racism um, and how racism impacts identity, belonging, meaningful engagement, and other such things. Uh, for instance, I think I already mentioned earlier on that when you look at racism, we see that there have been instances where black and brown bodies have felt the need or were conditioned to sort of see whiteness as, um, you know, uh, the, the standard. And so did everything in their power to try and make sure that they match that. That would include a screen, uh, skin lightening creams. Um, it would also include things like um, what they call code switching or a changing an accent, for instance. 
Uh, and the impacts of all of that, like racism as a system, is that the moment you sound a certain way, and this is what we call proximity to whiteness, you are a lot more acceptable in spaces that have historically been sort of um, kept aside for white people. So what racism really does and what colonization tried to do is maintain inequality and uphold unjust systems, right? So we've already um, sort of explained that things uh, like an unjust society ensures that it's not everybody who has access to resources. So things like quality education becomes inaccessible um, in an unjust society. And all of this, if you're looking at it in today's context, has also been created as a product of colon colonization, which is a product of racism. So people, um, predominantly black and brown people, not being able to afford or even access quality education is a, a product of racism and even colonization in most cases. So the idea of inferiority versus superiority or the ideas around that were concepts that were strongly pushed, um, especially in times where colonization was rife and you know was the thing of the day. And what it did is it painted indigenous people as savages. And this was done so in an attempt to justify the unfair treatments of other and certain groups of people. And even the takeover of whole countries and made them uh, colonies of these countries from the global north that we've just mentioned. And with that, we sort of move into this idea of like equality, social justice and equity, um, right? So the two boxes sort of uh, show you what equality is. It means that right now, as we are, regardless of uh, level of education, access to resources, and things like that, we all get access to the same sort of things, same amount of things. So let's say, for instance, I was a millionaire, and I already had five houses. Equality says, give me five more houses, give someone else five houses who may not even have had houses to begin with so what then that does is it gives me 10 houses in the end that person still has five houses another person maybe even has 20 houses because when we started to try and equalize like this society and when we tried to equalize um you know like the our places of being and belonging um it still just maintains the unjust systems that are currently plaguing our society um, and here's a quote that says, let there be no mistake, we expect equality as a basic human right. What this means is that we all have the same or equal access, right, to basic human rights. So we should all start at a standard level. We should all start with access to education. We should all access to quality education. We should all start uh, with access to shelter. We should all start with access to clean water, right? And that's what that means. Uh, we expect equality as a human right. However, we should aspire for an even higher state than equality. The dream is social justice, especially in the world where we are currently living, where systems of oppression have been used to advance certain people. I'm hoping we're still together. I do see some more contributions uh, in the chat. We'll get to them in a little bit. Um, but so just by sort of understanding inequality. So now we sort of um, understood equality, right? Equality versus um, social justice or equity. Um, and so just by definition, right? Inequality has a lot to do with, for instance, uh, I'll take Gabriel in this one. Now, for instance, I've got 10 cars and I don't know what I would want to do with 10 cars, but if I did have 10 cars uh, and sort of made sure that Gabriel didn't have cars at all, or maybe only had one car, which Gabriel would have to sell to make a living, for instance, right? So that just sort of gives a bit of an example um, to like the way in which inequality manifests in our society, right? So, or I've been speaking about a just society and unjust society. Those are all, uh, or rather an unjust society is also driven by inequality. 
So the fact that we all don't have the same access to quality resources, to quality education, to quality land, to quality um, you know, food and things like that. Um, but what equality I think we've seen in the picture has is a lot to do with leveling the playing field. So then w wherever people are coming from, it doesn't matter. We just give them the same sort of resources and hope that they do with them what they need. Uh, so when we start looking or talking about equity, we're looking at the fact that we are needing to work toward a just and equitable society. And then that word again comes up, equitable. What does it mean? It means giving people the resources that they need. So you're no longer looking at people as just generic or you're no longer grouping people um, in the same sort of way and then giving them the same amount or access to resources. Um, in an equitable society, you are looking at the needs and the gaps and then you are fulfilling those gaps, right? So it could be through a just uh, social justice organization. It could even be government doing this, right? Realizing that those areas that are often called underprivileged or under-resourced need resources, access to resources, maybe need um, access to affordable housing, need access to affordable energy, uh, need access to all these things that are equitable or that allow those same people from those same areas to really just participate in the same ways in society that other people who come from otherwise called affluent areas would. And just by, um, I think what I've now shared, um, I do want to, for the next 10 minutes, um, give an opportunity to all of us. So this is an opportunity to maybe even un unmute. So please don't unmute without putting your hand up or putting a star in the chat. Um, but we're keen to hear, and you can even use the chat, right? You can type your um, answer in the chat more than happy to read it out. But what does a just world look like for you? What does a just world look like for you? Hello everyone, so you see in the chat, I've put a little asterisk. That's by saying star. So if you don't have a hand function, you can put it there to pass to Michelle um, to make sure that she notes your hand. Uh, in Nongue. Please go ahead. Thank you. And I must say, this is a very wonderful presentation that you have actually given us. Um, my thoughts on what a just world is, is when you look at the lowest person in the room that has the lowest income, are they still able to access basic needs such as health, education, food, water, and shelter? So for me, a just world looks like is when that person can actually still at the end of the day can access those basic needs and hopefully even more at the end of the day. But if we actually still haven't gotten to a point where there are people that are still able to access more than the other person, then we are still in an unjust world. So for me, basically, that's what uh, just what actually looks like. If the person in the room, if every person in a room can actually afford their basic necessities, their basic needs, and also if a disaster is also able to strike, how can they recover from that? If they can't recover the same way that I'm able to recover, then that is unjust. But if we are all still able to recover at a certain level, at the same level, then for me, that's what a just world looks like. So in this context where we're talking about climate justice, if maybe a situation were to happen in terms of flooding or droughts, for us to actually recover from that, if the lowest person 
in that community can also recover as the next person, then for me, that would be a just world. Thank you so much, Inang, uh, Inonge, for sharing. Um, Gabriel, I know that you are muted. Yeah, I think I just want to add, um, not add to what Nonge said, but just to, to add to the, the concept of justice, um, just in like, uh, an add on to what you were adding and saying me earlier, Michelle, is just that um, I think there's a saying, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. <laughs> um, but I think in our kind of movement, in our just movement, in our way forward to a just future, um, we need to acknowledge that some people don't even have boats. And so I think that's a big issue. And I'm not just talking about boats in the, sen in the, in the sense of, uh, of like actual like boats. I'm talking about the metaphorical boats of tools move through the space. You know, we don't want to lose people along the way. And so I think it's critical that we, we start there. We try to find out how we can kind of combat that injustice uh, so that we can make sure that as we build forward um, and as the tide rises, so to speak, it's, it's handled. Yeah, I did see Frida's hand, Michelle, so maybe go from there. Cool. Thanks, Gabriel. Um, thanks for that contribution as well as Inonge. I think that's, that's, those are quite important um, you know, contributions, as well as I think what I was also picking up from Inonge is that there should be uh, what should be called a basic income, some kind of basic income to make sure that um, it's equitable or maybe we equalize the world on that sort of front. But thank you so much for that. And before I move on to Frida's hand, just to maybe also uh, give some eyes to the chat. Uh, Gideon says, to me, a just world is a world where basic needs of life are at the doorsteps of people living in both rural, urban or remote communities. Sharon says, a just world to me is where the least privileged have access to all basic rights without so much struggle because they deserve it. And thank you. Great contribution from Inongwe. Edith says a just world should be a world of fairness, accessibility to basic needs without looking at race or status. And Anna says a just world is when people are able to enjoy their human rights. Titus says a world Oh, it's been a one minute. Tata says a just world is all about the simplicity of getting or accessing to or accessing resources. Um, and then I did see Frida's hand. Uh, I'm not sure where it went, uh, but while we find and look for that hand, um, ah, it's back. Um, after Frida, we're going to give to Panache. Uh, Frida, it's yours. Okay, so. Responding to the question, um, what a just world would look like to me, and I'll speak it from uh, a Zambian context because I'm coming in from Zambia. So for me, a just world is about, um, Inonge mentioned about people or having uh, access to basic necessities. So I think it is very important that everyone in our communities, both rural, urban areas, it doesn't matter which part of the country you're in, that everyone has access to the basic necessities, which um, should be water, um, access to good health, access to education. And I think uh, from a Zambian perspective, that's where we are lagging be behind because there's a very huge difference between our uh, between uh, communities in terms of access to health, access to um, uh, education, uh, even just uh, afford, um, affording a, a very nice home which can be shelter. So I think um, with um, saying that, I would say there's need for deliberate measures. And I think that's where equity now comes in, where you place in deliberate measures to now prioritize other communities within the context of your country that mm. are not able to access the basic necessities that other communities are accessing because it does not make sense. You are living in one country, but basic necessities are only much more favorable to the other side of the country. 
and I also wanted to talk about human rights. So recently in Zambia, there was an issue of where some houses of people were demolished because uh, there were claims to say those houses were built on illegal land. And then uh, we just switched a new government from last year. Then it has been also been reported to say there's another land that some previous political party members had actually allocated themselves illegally and built on their mansions. But these are people that are doing very fine, but the land was also obtained illegally. But there has been hesitation in terms of uh, demolishing those houses. So I, I guess even in the way um, when it comes to human rights and legal issues, the way other people are approached it's like the law only works for a certain group of people. Then there are other people that are more superior to certain human rights that are placed there. So other people don't feel protected. Other people um, are inferior. So even just among ourselves um, as a country, just the system itself is very um, colonized kind of. It's like we, we are so much behind in trying to harmonize the setup, the living setup. So I think it's a long way to go, but I think we just need to put up deliberate measures in terms of making sure because in basic necessities, these are very important. This, these are the first thing that every community should have actually before any other developmental project even comes on board. Because if you talk of health, you talk of education, those are very fundamental. So every community, whichever part of the country you are coming in from. And so it does not make sense. You take a third road, a very good road network to a community that has no access to clean water. Mm. Yeah, right. that, that is like for your own convenience, you that has a car that is coming in from a big city and not for the convenience of those people that are struggling to draw water. They don't even have cars. So again, our development means it has to be subjective. You look at what the people need exactly and every development, make sure that the basic necessities that people need are first covered before you prioritize luxurious development, trying to catch up with maybe other countries, but more, more your own people maybe are not even fully benefiting from those so-called developments. Yeah. Thank you. I think I've exhausted quite a lot. <laughs> No, you have. Thanks, thanks so much uh, for that contribution, Frida. Um, and in a spirit where I don't always want to add, to take away or even add to what someone would have said, uh, I'm just going to pass on to Panache. I know you've had your hand up for a while. Please go ahead. Okay, I'll just make mine really short. <laughs> um, for me, a just world is when people, regardless of race, sex, religion, ability, sexual orientation and social class are given the opportunity to gain support and be uplifted by a sense of community and to be given access to the same basic resources as their peers. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, you guys. I'm like, am I the one facilitating this Back to Basics workshop or am I being facilitated just from all of the input that's coming in from the chat as well as all of these contributions? Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for being engaging. Um, and I'm just also going to read uh, sort of like the, the contributions in the chat before we move on. I'm also noting time. Um, so you please allow me to, if I do see a hand and I don't say, um, please just know that it's a time constraint. Uh, Vincent said, it's very knowledgeable. We need to aspire for a higher status than equity in terms of climate justice. A just world would be that which the developed countries such as the US and Australia and more of which the development has con their development has contributed much to climate change are taking more investment to ensure that as much as the developing nations are working to eradicate climate change, the development is not slowed. That even the nations that are less privileged have a voice at the decision-making tables in terms of climate change. And I think that's quite important as well. And I think also feeds into the idea of reparations or climate reparations that we sort of opened with at the beginning. So thank you so much for that contribution, Vincent. Uh, James says, a just world is when everyone in the area is able to get resources, basic needs, and even services such as education and health 
equally disregarding their social status. Tina says it just spoiled is when people have access to basic needs at all levels, cost and not just in a selective manner. Thomas says it's a world where everyone enjoys their room in life. Brenda says a just world is like people, irrespective of their status, getting what they deserve. It could be access to education, both for the poor and rich. I'm not quite sure who Galaxy A2 Core is. So if you can please just either tell us who, who you are or just change your name, that'd be really, really helpful. It would also be really helpful for data reinvestments and us just consolidating our uh, register. So please make sure that you are using your name uh, in this space. Um, and they say justice is the concept of fairness. Social justice is fairness in healthcare, employment, housing, ATC. To add on to what everyone is saying, this is Nozibu Siso. A just world for me is where the less privileged have access to quality basic needs, not just basic needs, but quality basic needs. Archie Ford says a world, a just world is where there are fair rules of the game. For example, where some decisions are based on the recognition of the different capabilities that people have. And back to Galaxy A2. Um, they gave us examples, some examples of social justice. Um, um, please do refer to the chat for those. Noah says, a just world refers to our belief that the world is fair and consequently that the moral standings of our actions will determine our outcomes. This viewpoint causes us to believe that those who do good will be rewarded and those who exhibit negative behaviors will be punished. Uh, just reading two last contributions before we need to move on. Um, Gif says our belief that, okay, I've read that one already. Justice is the concept of fairness. Um, social justice is, is fairness as it manifests in society, which includes fairness in healthcare and employment. Um, and Natasha says it means the leaders in power giving back to the community through recognition of all that they were promised of and making sure that common man who woke up to make a vote is counted in all they need to start a life. Thank you guys so much for all of those contributions. Um, I really have nothing to add because those are so well articulated and um, quite well expressed as well. And I, I do share um, the same, if not similar views on what justice means to me. Um, and yeah, so that's, I think that's what um, a just world looks like collectively for us. And the exciting thing is we are all saying- um, I'm sure. the same stuff. Yes. Michelle, sorry, but I just want to say, a just world to me looks like you not having five cars. What? But what if I deserve the five cars? Um, but thank you for sharing that as well. Um, I mean, that is not a just world. What does one person need five cars for, right? It's just food for thought. Thanks for that, Gabriel. <laughs> so for me, right, or for us at the African Climate Alliance, when we imagine a just world, and where, especially if we're looking at it in the climate justice perspective, we then start to think around how we center BIPOC. So BIPOC is Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, and how we center Black, Indigenous, and People of Color in the climate justice movement, and how are we actively working toward dismantling harmful practices and information that are spread in the past and continues to perpetuate harmful ways of being in today's society. So things like racism, things like inequality, things like discrimination, um, all those things. How do we then make sure that we are centering the people that are often most impacted by these harmful practices? And I think as soon as we start to define that and as soon as we start to carve out what it looks like to center BIPOC and the climate justice movement, this could even look like, and I think we've got some contributions that were alluding to that. It could really look like making sure that whatever decisions are made, are not made outside um, or without consulting indigenous people. 
it means that if I'm going to create, um, like we heard in the context of Zambia, if I'm going to create some solutions for the country or for a region in Zambia, I'm not just going to develop something. Um, I'm going to have to go and consult people and actually really just listen to see what is needed and how I can offer help and not walk in and try to prescribe uh, a sort of solution or framework for a particular problem that I might not fully understand because I'm not experiencing it. Um, and so that is sort of for us, sort of like the beginnings of justice or so climate justice, ensuring that BIPOC are centered in these movements. You'll find that at the African Climate Alliance, um, we are Afrocentric. So it means in all our work, we are centering voices and experiences of um, Africans and folk or people in Africa. So we've spoken a little bit or even to link on decolonization and then a decentralization. So what we're gonna do is maybe um, have this or let this be just noting time. I'm gonna put it in the chat and then we can do this sort of like as a take home exercise. You can even email us later uh, if you know, you would like to engage further. But what is your understanding of the two concepts? I think now, like, what is your understanding of the uh, concept of decentralization and how the two can truly be embodied in today's society? Uh, so just maybe uh, to Gabriel first, and then we continue. Michelle, um, I think maybe just also um, offering the, the opportunity for people to share it in the Youth Activist Network. So uh, if you wish to join the Youth Activist Network, we'll sh make sure that you get all those links. But we've got one on Facebook um, and then one on WhatsApp for those who don't have a Facebook. Uh, and we really want to implore discussion and, you know, like really want to advertise an opportunity for young people to engage with one another from across the different regions. And so it would be really great if you took these questions and you even want to answer them in the in the WhatsApp group for those kind of like wanting to understand a bit more about it as well. Thank you so much for that offering. Um, this is why they say two heads are better than one. This is the reason. So thank you for that. Uh, we so if yes. I'm just I'm responding to the people in the chat work. I know I'm going to ask. I'm going to share all the links now into the into the, the link. Uh, thank you. It's, it's almost as though you prophesied that, that that's literally what's happening. Please share the links and all of that. Um, so just before we unfortunately um, are having to move into a close so soon, um, speaking a little bit about decentralization, right? So what colonialism did is it allowed for power and resources and access to be centered or centralized. It allowed for what we call monopolies to form. Uh, so if you look currently at the fossil fuel industry, uh, we could say that the fossil fuel industry has been monopolized and that you have um, just a few companies who are drilling and killing the environment while the rest of us are, fit, uh, are left to suffer. The same thing with a lot of other systems in the world where it's only a select few individuals with a concentrated amount of wealth. And so the act of decentralization um, realizes this and says how do we then empower people or how do we then allow people to stand in their power while taking apart the systems that were created to ensure that only a select number of people or a few people had access to these things and so this is a very very important concept when we start talking about decolonization as well and what justice could potentially look like so things like uh, in terms of facilitation, in terms of educational workshops that you might be hosting, just really understanding um, the power dynamic that comes with you being in the facilitator space, uh, like currently what's happening right now. Uh, dare I say I have most of the power right now just to sort of control how the room is feeling and how we engage, um, but being cognizant of the fact that sometimes you really need to have like a decentered approach, like a discussion, like a forum, like allowing everyone to, to contribute. And this is sort of uh, a society that needs to sort of be birthed um, that really, really practices uh, justice and decentralization as, as, as sort of basic concepts or foundational concepts. Um, so that is the invite. Um, right now, I will also open up the floor again 
for contributions. I'm not sure, Gabriel, if that's a legacy hand or if that's a new hand. Um, but it's a legacy hand. Cool. Thank you. Um, I will also read um, some contributions in the chat and then move on to uh, taking hands. So if you do have a contribution, please do put your hand up. Um, we are coming toward the end of our workshop quite sadly, um, but really have appreciated your engagement and just your being here today. Um, Gideon says, what a productive meeting. It's been, oh, what a productive meeting it's been. I have really learned a lot from today's session. Looking forward to Wednesday's session, can't wait. I'll speak a little bit about Wednesday's session in a little bit. Uh, Diana says, this forum is so educative. I've learned a lot uh, in today's session. Um, I will just wait for some hands. So if it's any contribution you'd like to put forward, um, if there's anything you'd like to know, anything you'd like clarity around, please do put your hand up and maybe even put it in the chat. Maybe just wait about 30 seconds, two minutes for people. I'm assuming we're all on the same page then. I see no hands. I do see a hand. Diana, I saw your hand. And I don't know whether that was a mistake because it went away as quickly as hey. it came up. Hi. Thank you so Hi, hi. Um, I'm so glad to be part of today's session. I've really learned a lot. And would you kindly tell us about the next session? Because it happens that the time that you've started, it doesn't start at that time. So would you tell us more about that? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so the next session, so, so, so the structure of what we do at ACA is that on Mondays um, at the end of a specific month, like this month was August, uh, at the end of the month on the Monday and the Wednesday, the Monday we have what we're calling back to basics workshops. That's the workshop that you're in today. Uh, on the Wednesday, we have what we call the ACA dialogue. And what that does is, is it aims to marry the uh, stuff that we would have learned like today's workshop all of that information um, to marry it with reality. So like, what are the practical uh, sort of applications of that? So we invite a panel of participants, a panel of um, practitioners. It could be in the climate change space. And because our theme for August is decolonization in the climate change space or in the climate justice movement is we have practitioners in the space. So people who have sort of lived experiences even, or people who are practicing terms such as decolonization, and those people come through and they have a discussion around what this could potentially look like. So we've only gone a little bit into it, but not quite in depth. And so that's what the Wednesdays are for. Um, taking Gabriel in on this one. I just want to add that uh, something that Michelle always leaves off is it's beautifully facilitated by Michelle. Um, and we can all agree that she's done amazing work this evening. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's always facilitated by Michelle. Um, and in the future, we'll also have another person involved in the, in the facilitation and the, and the dynamic. Um, but yeah, that's in essence, um, Michelle, you've, you've, you've eaten all the words on that. So I won't add on, but I just had to add that part on. Thanks so much, Gabriel. Uh, and I think that also sort of draws us to um, our end. Um, just one I think last contribution before we have to move into a checkout and unfortunately have to say goodbye to each other. Uh, Vincent says, decentralization, I think, is the most effective way in which most basic issues that involve climate change will be solved. We put on, we put our own future in our hands. Me, you, team members here, we can only do as much as individuals to affect real change by making lifestyle choices and even voting and appointing the leaders who we think can make a difference. Thank you so much for that final um, contribution, Vincent. Uh, th uh, thank you so much. Uh, and last sort of contributions. And the CEO says, I'm literally having goosebumps. I've gained a lot 
so sad I couldn't even share anything. Oh, you've shared enough. I think your presence here was just incredible. I'm so sad that I couldn't share anything as I'm still stuck in traffic. Well done, Michelle and the team. This was so informative. Thank you so much for that, Andy Siri. Diana says, thanks, Michelle. Amazing work. Uh, Talon says thanks to the ACA team. This was a great session. Thank you so much for feedback. Uh, Gideon says I can proudly be an ambassador for ACA in Zambia. So maybe let's take that conversation a little bit further. Um, thank you all so much for sharing your time with us today. Um, and as we sort of exit, just one last thing, maybe five minutes from your time. Uh, one last thing is just this. Uh, a small little check out. So in the chat, you can tell us one thing that you took away from the session, maybe a feeling word as well, and one thing you're looking forward to this week. My example is that I'm Michelle, and one thing I took away from the session is that climate justice and equality and equity are closely related. I'm feeling hopeful, and one thing I'm looking forward to this week is resting at the end of the week. Um, so this is another I would say that um, yeah, my name is Gabriel. And one thing I took away from the session is that uh, everyone in this movement wants to contribute to change and difference. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Gabriel. Yes, Frida. Hi, everyone. Um, one thing I've learned today is about um, equity and uh, yeah, it's kind of opened up my mind. And one thing I'm also looking forward to is having a lot of rest by the end of the week. Thanks for that, Frida. Uh, Bamuja says, one thing I took away is justice and equality. Thank you for that. Luke says, one thing I've taken away is new perspectives on climate justice and looking forward to the end of the week too. Samson says, I've learned a lot on needs of equity and resources. Natasha says, I've learned a lot and very excited to teach others about the information. Thank you so much for that. Um, I am not wanting to keep everyone hostage here. Um, so <laughs> uh, unfortunately I am having to say this is the end of our session today. Uh, but before we officially close, Taylor says climate justice and social Injustice is a violation to human rights. Looking forward to a productive um, week ahead. Uh, Diana says, I learned a lot about how decriminalization and climate justice all relate. Looking forward to a peaceful week. Uh, give me a little bit of that peace, Diana. Uh, Brenda says, thanks to the ACA team, I've learned a lot and hope to learn more in the next meeting session. Our climate, our priority. And then Anna says, one thing I've learned is that change is within us. Thank you. Um, and Siwe says, um, I love being called Siwe. My bad. Siwe says, I learned a lot, but out of the presentation, I've just gained confidence to share this information. Michelle's confidence on this is out of this world. Thank you, team. Thank you so much. Mohini also says, I've learned so much. And with that, I think, we are sadly having to come to a close. Um, sadly, I really don't want to say goodbye as well, um, but we are having to say so, so that we can keep some goodness for Wednesday's session, where we have a panel um, uh, that are going to be speaking more on this uh, topic and you know can, can, can sort of share their learnings with us. So that's quite exciting. If you haven't registered, please do. Um, you will find all the relevant links on our social media, so our Facebook, um, our Instagram, our Twitter, our LinkedIn. And with that, sadly, I'm having to say goodbye. Uh, for data reimbursements, again, follow the link. And looking forward to engaging with you again later this week uh, and even in the coming weeks and months. And thank you so much once again. And goodbye and good night.